So we were still talking about dimension. Um, so we had um, finished by a um, theorem about the dimension of An. So theorem. So we have that the dimension of the n is equal to n. And uh, if um, let f in a n be a polynomial of positive degree, Uh, then uh, the dimension well, here is maybe say irreducible. Then the dimension of uh, the zero set of f is equal to n minus one. So the dimension of hypersurface is one less than that of the ambient space. And the third one was that if I have a subvariety of a n which has dimension n minus one, it is a hypersurface. So if X in the N is a closed subvariety of dimension N minus 1. Uh, then it follows that X is equal to ZF for F. Irreducible. Um, okay, so we had proven uh, the first two, and the last one is uh, very simple. So we can maybe do it. So we just prove three. So we have X somehow is a closed sub, sub variety of a n, and it's not. Uh, equal to n because after all it hasn't has dimension n minus one, so uh, there exists some polynomial f uh, which lies in the ideal of x. No, because it's, uh, there will be some such polynomial, <laughs> and. Um, Again, uh, we can, can choose F irreducible. So again, so actually F is also not constant because X is also not the empty set. Um, so if we, again, if we have an F here in the ideal of X, X is a prime ideal, so one irreducible component. Is, so whenever we find there is an F here, and so therefore there is also an irreducible F in the ideal of X. And so uh, thus X is contained in the zero set of F. Um, both are irreducible. And they are of the same dimension. Uh, so we know that uh, if we have uh, one uh, variety contained within another, which are both irreducible and of the same dimension, then they must be equal. Because the statement was that if a variety is strictly contained in another, then the dimension is smaller. Okay. So um, then it's thus it follows that x is equal to z of f. So I should maybe notice that um, so in uh, 2 and 3, 
I can drop the assumption that it's, that it's irreducible. So that uh, either f for 2 or x is irreducible. Because uh, by definition, the dimension of, uh, uh, if you have a di dimension of, a, uh, of a, an algebraic set, of, so is uh, equal to, to the maximum of the dimensions of the irreducible components. So if f is a polynomial which is not irreducible, then it has, then its zero set is a union of the zero sets of irreducible components, and each of them has dimension n minus one, so the thing also has dimension n minus one. So we don't have to worry about that. And even here, if x is a closed subset of a n, um, which has, well, no, that's not true. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so if every irreducible component has dimension n minus 1, then it is a hypersurface. But that's not the same as that the dimension is n minus 1. Okay, so I'll leave it maybe like that. Okay. So, corollary, so another corollary is... What? What? Nothing in the mark? No. So in part two, we can, can assume, we can drop the assumption that f is irreducible. And the statement is still true. And we also find that every a fine variety is finite dimensional. Because um, we have seen that AN has dimension N. If you have an affine variety, it's isomorphic to a closed subvariety of some AN. So its dimension is smaller or equal to N. I mean, for that N. So I just write it so if x subset n is a closed subvariety, then it follows the dimension of x smaller or equal to n. So that, um, okay, don't have to. So now, um, we want to, uh, in some sense, have some kind of generalization of this part two. Namely, instead of saying we take uh, the dimension of a zero set in AN of such a polynomial, we take an affine variety and we take its intersection with the zero set of polynomial and we want to see that the dimension goes down precisely by one, okay? So let x in, say, a large n be in a fine variety. Of dimension small n. So let f be a polynomial in this fine space, um, which uh, does not lie in the ideal of x, so it doesn't vanish identically on x, then if, uh, if I have that the zero set of f intersected with x is not equal to the empty set, it could happen, 
But if it doesn't, then it follows that the dimension of ZF intersected X is equal to uh, N minus 1. The dimension, if you intersect with the hypersurface, the dimension goes down precisely by 1. Okay? And this is, you know, could view this part 2 here as a special case. So I should remark, I'm not saying here, so this intersection might very well be reducible. It could no, it, it's not said that it's irreducible, okay? So by definition, the dimension of something reducible is the maximum of the dimensions of the irreducible components. So thus, uh, it means, the statement means that uh, uh, the dimension, so for all irreducible components, of uh, ZF X, so I maybe call this component Y of ZF, Z, so YI of ZF intersected X, we have that the dimension of YI intersected with, so YI is, e is smaller or equal to N minus 1, and there exists an I, there exists a component yi with dimension of yi is equal to n minus 1. That's what it means that the dimension of this is n minus 1 because it says the, the dimension of something reducible is the maximum of the dimension of the components. In fact, we will later prove something stronger is true. So later we'll show that all irreducible components have dimension n minus 1. Okay, but for the moment we prove the weaker statement. We uh, are not yet quite ready to prove what is really I mean, what is really the truth here? <coughs> so, so now, <coughs> again, this will be will take some effort. So let's see. So this I called proposition. <coughs> so okay. So now let's start with the proof. So somehow, we want in some way or other uh, to reduce this to the previous theorem. I mean, to the part two. So to the case of hypersurfaces of AM. You know, we know it in, in that special case. We want to somehow relate it to that. But you know, it's not completely trivial to see how this should work. But you know, we have one tool to relate a variety to, uh, to AN. It is Noether normalization theorem. We always know that if you have a variety of a finite surjective morphism to some a n. And in fact, if x has dimension n, it has a finite surjective morphism to a n. To this, no? so, so we, I write, just so that I have it, y uh, equal to x intersected with z f. And uh, then as, um, that F, as f does not lie in the ideal of x, it's not equal to x, so it's strictly contained. So by uh, what we know is that we know, therefore, the dimension of y is smaller than that of x. So it follows that the dimension 
of y is smaller or equal to n minus 1. Okay? So one, in, one kind of direction of this equality we know. And now, you know, to prove the other, uh, the other inequality, we will use the Newton normalization theorem. So by the Newton normalization theorem, there exists, we have a finite surjective morphism, a finite uh, surjective morphism, um, say, pi from x to a n. No? Because there is a finite surjective morphism to some affine space and it preserves the dimension, so it must be this one. So we want to make use of the fact that this is finite, again using this thing with the uh, monic polynomials. So we, I identify uh, kx1 to xn, so the coordinate ring here, with its pullback. which is a subring of AX. So I will somehow view now the XI as uh, elements in AX, just identifying them, just dropping the P upper star in the notation. So by the finiteness, you know, pi is finite, um, we know uh, that in particular, you know, remember that F, so let F be the class of our polynomial F in AX. So in particular, so this is an element in AX, so as a you know, AX is uh, finite over KX1 to XN. It follows that F satisfies the monic equation. Okay, so then we can write uh, there exists a non zero polynomial, a monic polynomial, uh, say X N plus 1 to the D plus sum i equals 0 to d minus 1, a i x n to the i, where the a i are elements in k x1 to x n, uh, such that this polynomial is satisfied by f. So if I take h of x1 to x n comma f, this is equal to zero. Okay, so this is uh, you know just the fact that uh, f satisfies a monic equ equation with coefficients in k x one to x n. So we know that. So replacing, so if, yeah, I just write it, replacing H by an irreducible factor, if necessary, we can assume H is irreducible. You know, if we have a monic polynomial, we write it as a product of two other uh, polynomials, then, um, you know, up to maybe multiplying one by a constant and the other one by the inverse of the constant, uh, we find that these two polynomials, again, have to be monic so that the product can be monic. You know, just the, the, this term, x to the, 
you know, it can only come from one, monic, one factor from the one side and one factor from the other side. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is, uh, so, th so therefore, if, I, if H is not irreducible, I can just write it as a product of, uh, uh, of factors. And if uh, this polynomial is zero, if I put F into it, then one of the irreducible factors must, must have the property. And so, therefore, I can just replace H by that. So I can always assume that H is irreducible. So now I use this. So I define a morphism. So let phi um, pi comma f from x to a n plus one. So just uh, on the first, I just take the map, which maps uh, you know here into a n. It's the map pi, and then the last component of the map is f. So we know that you know, pi is obviously just equal to uh, this map phi composed with the projection to the first few factors. So x1 to xn. No? So if I take the map from an plus 1 projecting to the first n coordinates, then I get just pi. No, if, I, you know, if, I, if I start, the point is this map is just given by adding an extra coordinate where it's f. And so I get rid of that. Okay, so that's clear. We know that this is finite. So therefore, uh, we know that if a composition of finite morphisms is, is uh, if a composition of morphisms is finite, then the first one is finite. So phi is finite. It's always the same tricks. And um, by definition, we have that the image of X is contained in the zero set of this polynomial H. Because um, what does it say for all? You know, <clears throat> you know <clears throat> so the, if I replace to, uh, this is just what is written here. No? If I have the, the so this is just, uh, so <clears throat> if I re restrict uh, this f, to x, it becomes just the, the function f. And here it precisely says that this expression, if I apply h to, to this, I get 0. So that means precisely that the image of x lies in the zero set of h. So you know, as this is a finite morphism, this is a closed subset. So thus, of x um, is a closed subset of dimension n in so a closed subvariety of dimension n in z of h. No, because it's a finite morphism, so it preserves the dimension. So it's also still n. And now, again, z of h is a, the zero set of a polynomial, of an irreducible polynomial in a n plus 1. It has dimension n. It contains as a closed subvariety another variety of dimension n. So they are equal. So thus... Um, uh, phi of x is equal to z of h. So in other words, phi from x to z of h is a finite subjective morphism.
And now, uh, although it uh, doesn't seem so evident, we are almost done. So in some sense, we see now that we have somehow, you know, at least we have replaced x by a hypersurface in the n plus 1. We'll now see. But it's actually better. So if we now, we have to keep this. Where's the formula here? So by definition, if we take this z of f intersected with x, if we look at this map, I claim that this is equal to phi to the minus 1 of the 0 set of h and xn plus 1. So we are here in an. We know that phi of x is equal to c of h. So if I take its inverse image of z of h, this will be x. And uh, this f, the, the, the last component was just f. So it maps, uh, so the inverse image of xn plus 1 will just be f. And so this z of f with this is just the common zero set of h, the inverse image of this. Because the inverse image of the zero set of xn plus 1 is the zero set of f. And the inverse image of um, h, of the zero set of h, is x. So this is really OK. But you know, if you look at this, we have here we have here our wonderful ah we have here our wonderful nominal h. I hope you. I mean, I don't know why, why. So I mean, I was all the time talking about h. I forgot to write that it was called h. Now, either you knew it anyway. I mean, either you understood it, which I hope, or otherwise. Uh, it is very strange that you wouldn't say anything. You know, because, I mean, obviously it's a mistake of me to not write. I mean, but on the other hand, here it says this and that h of this is equal to 0. So, I mean, it wouldn't have made very much sense at this point. But, you know, still, uh, anyway, this is h, okay? And it was all over the, I mean, was all over the place. So, I can only hope that uh, you were aware of that. So, anyway. What? <laughs> no, I'm sorry too, but uh, you know, it's a, but you know, in order not to feel too guilty, I have to give the fault to you. Okay, so here we are. <clears throat> so this is fine, but now we we look at this h. So we have the zero set of h of, of x n plus one. So then we can also, in, for looking at this common zero set, we can put x n plus one equal to zero in this thing. It's the same as the zero set of xn plus 1 and whatever remains of h when we put xn plus 1 equal to, to 0. And what remains? The constant term. So this is the same as phi to the minus 1 of uh, uh, a0 and xn plus 1. No? So in other words, this is the same as uh, the inverse image of uh, the zero. So the zero set of a zero. You know, a zero depends on, on the first few coordinates, no? only on the coordinates one to n times zero. The last coordinate is zero. So now this means this now. So if I take something times 0, it's obviously isomorphic to this without taking it times 0. So this thing has the same dimension as the 0 set of A0. And A0 is a hypersurface. Okay? And a Z of A, I mean, so um, so thus the dimension of Z of F 
intersected x. Yes? Where? Yeah, of A0 and, so these are two different functions. A0 is the constant term of this, but point, that is, means it's a polynomial in x1 to xn. And if I put xn plus 1 equal to 0, then you know, the only thing that remains of H is A0. And therefore, if I take the common 0 of this polynomial and x0, it's the same as the common 0 of, so if I take, so I take the common zeros of H, and x0. That's the same as the common zeros of x0 and whatever I get from h if I put x0 equal to 0. That is the common zero of x0 and a0. Okay, so that's, um, and that gives you this. And now, <clears throat> but this just means it's the, this is z of a0 times 0. z of a0 is a closed subset in a n. No? So the dimension of this will therefore be equal to the dimension of the zero set of A0 because phi is a finite morphism. It preserves the dimension. Um, and now this is a hypersurface in AN. So we know for a hypersurface in AN that um, so either A0 is constant, uh, then it follows that Zf intersected with x is equal to the empty set. Or otherwise, the dimension of uh, uh, Z of A0 is equal to n minus 1 because that was the theorem that we had, or the yeah, part of the theorem that we proved for a hypersurface if the intersection is not empty. So if you have a non-zero, if you have a hypersurface, so a hypersurface is always the zero set of a non-constant polynomial. Well, you know, that depends, you know, on, I kind of have changed what I, how I called it a few times, but so an irreducible hypersurface is a zero set of an irreducible uh, polynomial. Now, <clears throat> uh, if you have a polynomial which is not irreducible, then you know it has a is a product of irreducible uh, compon uh, uh, components, and its zero set is the union of the zero sets of those. And so the dimension of the zero set is still equal to n minus one because each of them has dimension n minus one. But if the polynomial is constant, then the zero set is either everything, if it's zero, or it is uh, nothing, if the, it's a non-zero constant. So therefore, the zero set of this will either be empty or it has dimension n minus one. Okay, and so this, um, uh, well, and that proves it. No, because we wanted to prove that dimension. That uh, the statement was precisely that the intersect that the zero set of uh, the inter that the intersection of a hypersurface with a, a, with an, a fine variety was dimension one less, unless it was empty. I mean, okay. So now. Uh, Where am I actually? Yeah? Yeah. No, no, in this case, it is injective because you have a subjective, uh, a finite subjective morphism. And so it is, it is, I mean, I, it was only for notational reasons that I made the identification, but it is okay because it is injective because we have a subjective morphism. And then, so therefore the pullback is injective. So there's no problem with that. Yeah, otherwise it would be, most likely would allow me to prove uh, things which are not true if I would uh, 
make identifications via maps which are not injective. Okay, so now we come to something, to another uh, result with, with uh, this um, approach to dimension is uh, kind of one of the more uh, difficult theorems. Uh, if there's other ways how one can define dimension, then, it would be, then this would be very obvious and other things would be much more difficult. But anyway, the theorem is that the dimension of a variety and an open, a non-empty open subset are equal. Okay? So that somehow the dimension is something which only depends how, on how the variety looks like almost everywhere. And um, from the de definition, it almost looks obvious, but then if one looks a bit more carefully, it, one actually has to work. So let X be variety. And U in X, a non-empty open subset, uh, then the dimension of X is equal to the dimension of U. So, <clears throat> so anyway, this is quite a, a fundamental property. I mean, if you have many folds, you have an open subset of a manifold, and it's also a manifold of the same dimension. So, you know, if you want to, you really want uh, this to be true. So, one direction is kind of uh, easy, but uh, if I want to write it the way I wrote it, I have to do like this. So, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> I want to show that. Uh, you know, as u is contained in x, one would expect the dimension of u is smaller or equal to that of x, and that is actually the easy direction. So let u1, u0 contained in u1, and so on, until un equal to u be a chain in u. Then we can, we want to make a chain in x of the same length. And we do this by taking the closures. So let xi equal to ui, so the closure of ui in x. Note that by definition, uh, we have that um, ui is equal to u intersected with xi. No, you know that uh, this uh, u carries the induced topology as, as usual, and then, so then uh, it is an intersection of um, u with a closed subset. In particular, it's certainly, so ui is the intersection of a closed subset of x, and certainly it is the intersection then it must be the intersection of the smallest closed subset of X which contains it. Okay, so that's uh, uh, <clears throat> clear. So therefore, thus the XI are not equal because otherwise, uh, and so we get a chain. is a chain in X. Also, the, the UI, are, you know, if it's a chain, the UI are supposed to be irreducible, then we know that the closure is also irreducible. So it's, uh, it's fine. So we get a chain in X, and thus the dimension of X is bigger equal to the dimension of U. So that is the easy part. Now, if you want to do the other direction, it, even, it looks, in some sense, even simpler. So you could just say you take a chain in X, and then you make a chain in U by taking all the intersections, you know, called UI, XI intersected with U. 
And this way you get a chain in U which has the same length. But there is an error in this statement, in this, uh, in this argument, because there's no reason to believe that, for instance, x0 has to lie in U. So we might not be able to get a chain like this by intersecting just with U. So we have to somehow make sure that we, you know, that we can do this. And so we have to take a bit more effort. But still, let's start. Let me see. So the first statement that we, that we first want to reduce to the case that x is a fine. Okay. So um, how do we do this? So we again start with the chain in x. And now we take any open affine subset of x. Let w in x be an open affine subset uh, with x0 in w. You know, if you have such a chain, it starts with a point. Um, and um, Well, you know, we know that any variety has an open cover by uh, affine subsets. So certainly we can find an open affine subset which contains the point x0. You know, in, if you have such a, <clears throat> so we should maybe, uh, yeah, I have to be slightly more, so I have to be slightly more careful. So I want a chain which starts with a point. Now, in principle, we can always, uh, so here I was not assuming it's a maximal chain, but I can always, if, if, if the lowest one is not, uh, not a point, I can also, uh, you know, if this has, in some sense, positive dimension, I can make it longer by putting a point here, okay? So we take, um, so we can take such an open affine subset. Um, and then the argument that I just sketched uh, in words uh, will work. No, I can just take the intersection with the xi with w, and this gives me a chain in w of the same length. So let wi equal to xi intersect with w for all i. Um, so then. Uh, we know that w i plus one is dense in x i plus one. So, and uh, x i is not. So, uh, it follows that w i plus one strictly contains w i for all i. So, thus you know, W0, which is, of course, equal to X0, contained in W1, Wn, is a chain in W. Actually, I could, yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. I don't want to call this. Use the issue more. Okay, so we get in this way a chain in W. So for any chain in X, there is a strict continence. what? The yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. So for any chain in X, I find a chain in W of the same length. So the dimension of W is bigger equal to that of X. We know already the other uh, direction. So it follows that the dimension of X is equal to the dimension of W. 
So when I, if I have a for every variety x, there is an open affine subset which has the same dimension. So therefore, so thus you can replace, uh, say, x by w and u by w intersected u. And um, so if we prove that the dimension of w is equal to the dimension of w intersected u, then we have uh, proven the statement that dimension of x is equal to dimension of u. So, so to reduce to the case x is a fine. So now we assume that x is a fine. So first, so x is a fine. Well, this is in a moment still not easy enough for us, so we first do it in the case that x is a fine space. So now we deal with the case that x is a n. So if x is equal to a n, so we can take let uh, x0 be a point in u. And um, I put, um, say, x i, whatever, x i, so large x i, the space, uh, I put this to be, uh, say, an affine linear subspace. containing x i minus 1 for all i. So for instance, if the point x 0, for instance, if the point 0 lies in, in u, no, we are in a n. If the point 0, 0, 0 lies in u, we can take as x i just you know, the 0 set of the coordinates from uh, x i plus 1 until xn, so that we have, a, you know, like we did before. So these are just all linear subspaces. And uh, then uh, we put uh, ui equal to xi intersected u. And we get again a wonderful chain. Um, uh, un is a chain in u. And so we get the dimension of an open subset in an is n. So to finally deal with the case that we have an, uh, that x is a fine, we need to use again the neutral normalization theorem to reduce to the case of an. Okay. So now, so it's all a bit. And this is. Again, a little bit this trick. So if x is a fine, so then we have there exists a finite subjective morphism um, say phi from x n, where I assume that n is the dimension of x. So now we take the complement of x. So we have x 
minus u is a closed subset of uh, x. And we can take phi of x and say call this z. This is a closed subset. This is lies obviously in an. It's closed because we have a finite morphism. And uh, you know, as this is a closed subset of x, um, so every irreducible component of it has dimension smaller than that of x. And this finite morphism preserves the dimension. So therefore, z has dimension smaller than n. And in particular, they are certainly not equal. Or I could also say this is the case because as a finite morphism, it preserves strict inclusions of closed, of irreducible closed subsets. Anyway. So because phi is finite. So let f be a polynomial which vanishes on z. And we put v to be the complement of this zero set. Then this is, uh, an, this is this V. V is open, dense, so open and non-empty in N. So we have the dimension of V is equal to N. On the other hand, we can put W to be the inverse image of V. This lies of V. This lies in X. And in fact, um, <clears throat> if you look at it, it lies actually in X minus Z. But you know, maybe we don't need it. So for the moment, however, it certainly is an open subset in X. So phi is a surjective closed morphism because it's finite. So if I you know, restrict it to the pre-image of this thing, it's still subjective. And it's also closed because we have the induced topology on both sides. So we have that phi restricted to w from w to v is subjective and closed. So therefore, we know if you have a subjective closed morphism, then the dimension of the source is bigger or equal to that of the target. So we have the dimension of W is bigger or equal to the dimension of V, which we knew to be equal to N. But now, <clears throat> Um, by definition, we have that U contains W because what is, uh, you know, we have taken V by taking the complement of Z of F, and F is something which lies in the ideal of Z. So the inverse image of this thing will. Uh, 
certainly contain the whole of U. No? So U contains W. So therefore, the dimension of U is bigger equal to the dimension of W, which we have just seen is bigger equal to N. And now uh, this proves it because the other uh, direction we had. But you see it's a bit, <clears throat> so the basic idea is somehow quite simple that, or is uh, that in some sense, you know, what you want is the argument that I gave in the beginning that you, uh, if you have a chain in X, in, in U, you get a chain in X by taking the closures and you get a chain in U by taking the sections with U, but that doesn't quite work. This only goes in the works, uh, you know, under some, uh, you know, because you would need that X zero lies in, in U, but uh, you can still use the argument to prove that you can assume it's a fine and then you, uh, that you can assume that X is a fine. And if X is itself a N, it's easy to see. It's kind of straightforward. You just intersect with linear spaces. And otherwise, you somehow use the neutral uh, normalization theorem to reduce to the case of a N. But then there's a little bit of a kind of a slightly complicated argument in the end to see how you reduce to the case of a N, which uh, is somehow by, uh, you know, taking the image, the pre-image, and so on. <laughs> but anyway. But the basic uh, thing is that, you know, so you, have a, you have to make, you know, it's a little bit, it's not just you, you say I want to reduce and then you reduce, but then you have to see it's, uh, you know, how do you get, go back and forth. And uh, so one way to do it is like this. Also, do, you, do we have a relation in the case of you is closed? What? If you is, cl if you is closed. Yeah. Well, if you is closed, we know that the dimension is smaller. No, so you know you, you know that open subsets are dense, so the closed subset is always much smaller, and we know that you know we had this theorem that if we have a variety, then every closed subvariety has a smaller dimension, and so uh, if it's not a subvariety but just a closed subset, it's a union of uh, subvarieties, and each of them has smaller dimensions, so the dimension is smaller. Okay, so it's. Uh, you know, the relation there is quite. Uh... So, <clears throat> as a. Get some. Uh... <clears throat> so, some corollaries. So, first corollary. So all quasi-projective varieties are finite dimensional. So all what we had called varieties are finite dimensional. Because we had seen that every variety has an open cover by uh, affine varieties. And affine varieties are finite dimensional. And what? No, uh, oh, all. Yeah, I don't know. I started saying something and then. So all varieties are finite dimension. Okay, so as I said, you know, every variety has an open subset, which is an affine variety. And you know that that has a certain dimension, a certain finite dimension, and the variety has the same dimension. Um, Another corollary is that if uh, we have varieties, if X and Y are two varieties which are birational, then they have the same dimension. Because we have seen that, so, so this, um, if x is birational, uh, is birational to y, 
then we know there are open subsets of X and of Y which are isomorphic. Non-empty open subsets, say U and X and V in Y, such that U is isomorphic to V. So then, by what we have just seen, as U is an open subset in X, a non-empty open subset in X, we have the dimension of X is equal to dimension of U. As U is isomorphic to V, its dimension is equal to that of U, and then uh, V is open in Y, so they have the same dimension. Okay, so this is quite simple. And then finally, we have the analog of what we had in the, the fine case for projective uh, varieties. So this is a corollary. So the dimension of projective n space is equal to n. This is because a n is an open subset or isomorphic to an open subset in Pn, so they have the same dimension. Then um, if uh, f in k x0 to xn is a homogeneous polynomial of positive degree, uh, then we have the dimension of the zero set of F in Pn is equal to N minus one. Um, so here maybe, well, and anyway, the last one is that if um, X in Pn is a subvariety, so a closed subvariety uh, of dimension n minus 1, then x is a hypersurface. Homogeneous and irreducible. Okay, so I will not say so much to that. The last one, 3, is precisely you just copy the same proof as uh, as in the affine case, and two is also more or less the same. So by a projective transformation, so we just take a linear change of coordinates, transformation, can assume that F, that the zero set of F is not contained in the hyperplane at infinity. This anyway would be, you know, if we have uh, some polynomial, we can change the coordinates so that it's not the hyperplane at infinity. Well, and then, then if I take the zero set of F, intersect it with, in some sense, with U zero, but I could say, I just write with the N. No, this is, equal to the zero set of the polynomial F, which we have dehomogenized. So it's just a hypersurface in AN. So this has dimension N. N minus one. And it's dense. It's an open subset of the zero set of F. So also the zero set of F has, has dimension n minus one. And um, I just say, for the last one, I just say you now do the same proof as in the affine case. You know, you just say that, uh, you know, X, uh, you take 
an element in the ideal, some f in the ideal of x, some irreducible element in the ideal of x, then x is contained in the zero set of this polynomial. And uh, as both are irreducible of the same dimension, they are equal. And that's it. No? We did this just at the beginning of this lecture. Now uh, we can prove uh, the statement that I had uh, said before when I proved this uh, fact about the intersection of, an, a fine of a variety with a hypersurface. Namely, we can prove that now if we take the intersection of a variety of an affine variety with a hypersurface that every irreducible component of the intersection has dimension one less. No? And this uh, is done, is actually very easy. Uh, namely, what we do is just we, we consider the open subset where we throw away all the irreducible components of the intersection except for one. And then this thing has the same dimension. And, and then if you argue for this, it's with, there's, it's, it means the intersection has just one irreducible component. And the dimension of the intersection is n minus 1. And so this irreducible component has dimension n minus 1. So it's uh, somehow we use this previous theorem to turn this into some kind of triviality, whereas before it seemed impossible. <coughs> so let's see. So theorem. I still call it theorem because it's uh, important. So let x in the n be in a fine variety. And let f be a polynomial, which does not vanish on x then every irreducible component of uh, you know, the zero set of f intersected x has dimension n minus, has the, uh, yeah, maybe I write still of dimension n. Okay, and then this must be like this. Do I want it like this? No, I, for some reason, maybe we will stick to my dimension. So, has irreducible component of this thing has dimension, the dimension of x minus 1. So, <clears throat> it's actually funny because in the previous case, we said that, you know, so the, the weaker statement was if the intersection is not empty, then it has dimension n minus 1. So this somehow looks like uh, this statement is stronger also in another way that it says something about non-emptiness, but that's not the case. You know, if the intersection is empty, this means there's no irreducible component, and so this theorem says nothing. Okay? So uh, it just says that every irreducible component, if there's any, has dimension n minus 1. A dimension of x minus 1. Okay. Now let's come to the proof. So let we take any irreducible component of this thing. Let z be an irreducible component. of the zero set of f intersected with x. And we take w to be the union of all the other irreducible components. So we take a, a polynomial G, which lies in the ideal 
of w, but not in the ideal of x. So this g vanishes on all these irreducible components of zf intersected x, except for our, uh, for the z. So this is not, I wanted this. Okay, we have this, this, we have chosen one irreducible component. We want to show that this irreducible component has dimension, dimension of x minus one. And we do it by throwing, away, we will do it by throwing away all the other irreducible components by restricting to an open subset. And um, so we have here the union of the other irreducible components. We take a polynomial which vanishes on all other irreducible components, but not on the one we are interested in. And we let u be equal to x without the zero set of g. Now, <clears throat> you know, we want to, uh, you know, u has now the wonderful property that u is an affine variety. You know, we had this theorem that uh, if we take the complement of a polynomial in the fine variety, it's again in the fine variety. So we can use the results we proved for fine varieties for this thing, although it is an open subset of X. So then U is an affine variety. And um, if I take U intersected the zero set of F, well, we have just done it in such a way that the only part of the zero set of F that intersects U is Z. No, because we have thrown away all the other ones. So this is just u intersected with z. And now this, um, if you, <clears throat> so this is however still a hypersurface in this affine variety u. Now if you also remember how it was shown that this is a fine. It's actually a closed subvariety of a n plus one. No, and the the first n coordinates are the same. So if I, f is a polynomial in k x one to x n, it's also a polynomial uh, wherever u lives. No? So therefore, I mean, I hope you remember that, but or whatever, or look it up. So, um, so therefore, by uh, so and f is uh, a polynomial function on u. So we find that u the dimension of z intersected u is equal to the dimension of x, of dimension of u minus one, because it's a hypersurface in uh, this thing. And, uh, you know, u is an open subset in x, so this is equal to the dimension of x minus one. And um, this is an open subset in Z. And so I find that my given irreducible component of this intersection, any given irreducible component of the intersection has dimension, dimension of X minus one, okay? So it's somehow, it looks a bit like cheating, but because you, you know, you just prove it by throwing away the others and still having the same theorem, but that's the way it works. Okay, so now we come to um, uh, somewhat an application, which is a, 
you know, which tells us in a kind of more precise way how um, the dimension changes under morphisms. So we had, for instance, uh, I had claimed at some point, so we had seen that if you have a finite subjective morphism, then it preserves the dimension. And I had said in the beginning, this, is, this uh, comes somehow, is supposed to be related to the fact that if you have a morphism with finite fibers, then it preserves the dimension. But I, we haven't proven that. Now we will prove something which uh, actually implies that. Uh, namely, we prove that uh, if the fibers all have a given dimension, then the dimension of the source is by that number bigger than that of the target. And actually, it's enough that this just holds over an open subset. So let's, uh, let me state it. So here I call it, well, I don't want to call it corollary, proposition. Let uh, f from x to y be a morphism of varieties. So you assume there exists a non-empty open subset U in Y such that all the fibers over points in U have the same dimension for all in U, uh, the dimension of F to the minus 1 of P is equal to some number N. So there's an open subset where the fibers all have dimension N. We assume that. Then it follows that the dimension of X is equal to the dimension of Y plus N. So this is, um, and in particular, for instance, if all the fibers are finite, then it means the dimension of the fiber is zero. Then the x and y have the same dimension. But uh, you know, if you, <clears throat> okay, not quite sure, and. Um, <clears throat> I don't quite know how to manage with time because it's a somewhat tricky. Um, I wanted to also state um, without proof a uh, kind of converse to this, which is a kind of the more <coughs> powerful theorem. And this is uh, called a theorem. without proof. So I will not prove it. <coughs> so this is, uh, is often called theorem on dimensional fibers. The statement is basically that um, this is if and only if, and actually slightly more than that it's if and only if, namely, um, let f from x to y be a morphism and assume that the dimension of x is equal to the dimension of y plus n. So maybe I take a subjective morphism. I mean, otherwise I will restrict to the image. Uh, then there are two statements. So first, there's the converse of this. I oh, know, first I have something else. So for all points P in X, in Y, we have that the dimension of the fiber is at least equal 
to the difference of the dimensions. So the dimension cannot, of the fibers cannot be too small. It can only be too big. And secondly, uh, there's an open dense subset. There's, there is a non-empty open subset uh, U in Y such that for all P in Y, the dimension of F to the minus 1 of P is equal to N. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so this is the, so the, this first thing is actually not so difficult. It follows by some modification of the proof I will be giving of, uh, for the proposition. It would be essentially, I could call this an exercise. So if you understand the proof well enough, you should be able to figure it out, although it is a somewhat hard exercise. The second one is actually much more tricky. I think one needs to, in order to prove this, one needs to prove a better version of the Noether normalization theorem. So it's a, um, <clears throat> anyway. So now, however, I have the, I think I have the problem that I cannot seriously try to prove, the, so I will not prove this theorem because it's a bit too complicated. As I said, the first one I could prove, or if I'm in a particularly nasty mood, I might ask you to prove it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, then I would have to, uh, but uh, you know, I, I will prove next time this. <clears throat> but I don't think I want to start now um, because I don't think I can get, uh, I mean, I can rush the proof. Then uh, just next time I will take five minutes more. Okay.